always feel like I need to approach every film the same way, which is really to listen to the director's visions, try to find uh, sort of words that would describe the film, basically really base my work on the scripts and on the emotions of the story. Because I think cinematography to me is not to photograph what's going on per se, but to catch and to sort of evoke emotions, just like music is. Carrie's and my work relationship was very much a communication back and forth. Carrie really initially guided me with objectives like, let's try to make every scene different, and that when we are in the scene and we go to another, that we get to a new environment, and that the sort of more separated the scenes are in looks and atmosphere, uh, the better it would feel like you would you would sort of expand the world a little more and we go from sort of Norway to Italy from Italy to London to London to Jamaica it's like you you do quite big leaps in geography and I was looking more to uh, colors and to uh, lighting styles for the different scenes so I would make mood boards for different locations and suggestions, and then I would communicate with Carrie and see how they thought about those things. So after Cuba, for example, when they go to the trawler, how can we shoot a trawler at night on the ocean and not, so it doesn't look black? You don't really want a film that um, is too artificially lit. I think I sort of like the idea that you work with the realistic colors and realistic environments, uh, but in a heightened reality, you would just choose the moments that are uh, more exotic or a little more special and I found a photograph of a person that was lit with red light and it was sort of a twilight sky behind him so I thought there's something to that and so we designed that whole scene being red which was an opportunity right there and then throughout the film we we sort of tried to find different color palettes to create richer environments with more depth. The largest set I think that we had was the exterior Cuba streets, which was a two-story backlot basically. And uh, we had to light it with something like nine mobile cranes in order to just get the streets lit like with an ambient light. And then we used a lot of practicals actually on the buildings. I love that though. It's like, it, it's, it's really lovely to design the film, you know, to create the light in the film. One shot that may be my favorite shot in the film is when we do the one in the staircase when Bond has to uh, fight sort of his last fight almost up the staircase, which is so symbolic. It felt great to put ourselves as a camera in the position of him, like to feel what he's feeling. It should feel as terrifying as possible and at the same time, it was a huge challenge because there was a lot of gunfire and we had not only Daniel walking through that, but also focus putter and um, an operator going through that without casting shadows and also not being in the way, sort of. But that shot is quite powerful in the film. The goal when we were shooting No Time to Die was to uh, get people to see it in the cinema because that's the absolutely best way to see a Bond movie. And that's also a big reason for why we decided to shoot it uh, on film and to shoot it on large format like IMAX. Shooting IMAX, the format goes from like 240 right out to below your feet and above your head. And you're sort of right inside the bubble like in a helicopter. And that way certain scenes could benefit because you're taken more into the story. The film is larger than life. We want to present it as wide and as big as possible. So that was a way to enhance it even more. With a Bond movie, you have an, an opportunity to take the audience on an emotional ride that goes all the way from, you know, stress and terror and, and, and hor horrific suspense to comedy and to love story in this case, which was great, I think, with this particular story too, No Time to Die. 